This episode of the Topcast is proudly brought to you by the Francis Clark Centre. Whatever you're doing that works well with the body, with the, if the body's working in, the, in its most effective way, then that is also what produces the best sound. So there isn't one type of teaching which is healthy piano teaching and it produces a sort of floppy sound. No, it's not. I mean, I, I, what we're aiming for is the most varied, most interesting qualities of sound so that people can do whatever they want musically. Hi, teachers. Welcome back to the Topcast. You're listening to episode number 217 and it's so great to be hanging out with you. And if you, I don't know if you can hear it, but I actually have a purring kitten on my lap right now who won't leave me alone. If you haven't yet met Bronson's little sister, Coco, then jump on my Instagram uh, channel and have a look at my stories where I'm posting daily updates of all the fun things that little Coco is doing. She's absolutely adorable and um, (laughs) causing lots of fun for our family and our boys. Uh, It's been great to have a new addition to the family. Bronson, though, not so sure about Coco yet. There's a bit of growling and hissing going on, but they've started to play just recently. Anyway, this episode is not about kittens. <laughs> it's actually about a fantastic book that I've got the author on to discuss today. It's called The Complete Pianist. It's an incredible resource for pianists and piano teachers alike. And my guest today is the wonderful author Penelope Roskell from the United Kingdom. Now, before I introduce Penelope, I did want to let you know that as the episode is dropping today, the 20th of November, we have introduced our Marketplace Black Friday sale. Yes, I know it's not Black Friday, but what we're doing is running a week-long promotion up until Black Friday. So, from the 20th to the 27th of November, if you head over to the Top Music Marketplace, you can get 25% off is uh, for any orders over $25. So 25% off for $25 spend and you can use that as many times as you want. The coupon code's on the site and I really encourage you to jump over there and go and have a look at all the great goodies that are now available from our over 100 sellers and almost 1,000 different items. It's absolutely going off and I hope you'll go and check it out during this period. The address for that is topmusicmarketplace.com. As usual, our show notes and transcript are going to be over at topmusic.co slash episode 217. Now, we do have a freebie for today. It's actually a giveaway. I actually have a copy of today's book. Now, today's book is a big book. It's quite heavy and it's about two inches thick. So, unfortunately, our Giveaway this week is only available to Australian listeners because I, oh, it's going to cost too much money to send this book internationally. But if you're an Aussie and you're listening to this episode and you would like to go into a little draw for a chance to win a copy of this book posted to you, then all you need to do is make sure you follow us on Instagram or Facebook and then share one of our posts about this podcast publicly on your profile. And make sure you tag our account either on Facebook or on Instagram, that's topmusic.co and use the hashtag Topcast Giveaway and we will announce a winner and email them by direct message or contact them by direct message. We need those entries in by the following Monday. So, if you're listening to this on the 20th, that would be the 21st, 2nd, 23rd at midnight Auckland time. Okay, so that is our current giveaway. You're going to hear lots more about this book and if you haven't been on my Instagram, then you can actually see copies of this. I've been talking about um, The Complete Pianist in my stories and things. So, it's a huge and incredible resource but as I say, it is quite heavy. It's going to cost a lot for us to post. So, just for our Australian listeners, look forward to seeing those entries come through. My guest today Penelope Roskell is an international pianist and professor of piano and pedagogy and at Trinity Laban Conservatoire in London. She's the author of The Complete Pianist, the book we're talking about, From Healthy Technique to Natural Artistry and of The Art of Piano Fingering. She's also the foremost UK specialist in helping pianists prevent and recover from injury. Well, welcome to the show, Penelope Roskell. So great to have you here today. Oh, it's lovely to be here. Lovely chatting to you and, and to all the listeners as well. Delighted. It's, it's been quite a while. We've, we've tried to get you on the show a few times and there's been a number of things that have cropped up. So, I'm glad we've made it work today. 
Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? I know you're based in the UK. You're incredibly well known. Um, you've written an amazing book we're going to talk about today. But give us a little bit of your background and tell us about your teaching at the moment too, where you're teaching and what kind of ages and that, that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, my main teaching venue is uh, Trinity Laban Conservatoire in London, which used to be Trinity College of Music, the one that's linked up with the exam boards that you know about. And so I teach there two days a week, and I also teach a pedagogy class there. And then aside from that, I do lots of online work, uh, workshops, classes, uh, lessons for a wide range of people. A lot of my students are also teachers, so we talk a lot about pedagogy and how we can use a lot of my ideas, and, and they use them in their teaching and so on. So I've got a – it's quite – Really interesting. I'm doing lots of work online at the moment. And uh, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. Did you move your university level teaching online in the pandemic? And are you still online? For the last few weeks, we were back on site. Um, but now I'm going back online as we're going back into lockdown again. So. Such a fun time, isn't it? We've, uh, we've, <laughs> we, we went through exactly the same thing about four months ago. <laughs> While you guys yeah. were all having drinks and bars and pubs in summertime and we were all <laughs> locked down, we were like, oh, you, oh, that's so annoying. Anyway, um, yeah. look, you'll get through it, I'm sure, and um, things will be okay. At least you know what you're doing now, you and all the other teachers over there who've got to go back to the online yeah. lessons. And I'm fortunate because I can do lots of things online. I've got good internet and... I'm doing lots of classes online. I've got a, a workshop I'm doing tomorrow. So, you know, I've got lots of activities going on. So it hasn't affected me too badly. But it, so I imagine you teach at quite a high level for some of your students. How have you found the transition to online lessons for the really advanced level students playing, you know, difficult Rachmaninoff and Chopin and, and those kinds of works? Well, I find what I'm doing with them is you're seeing their intention. You know, the sound may not be great. Uh, it may not even be synced with the visuals, but you can see what they're trying to do. And so you can imagine the sound that they are actually producing. And so I find you can, you can do a good lesson. You can work on, on technique. You can work on musicianship. It's not great quality of sound, but you can still do a good lesson, I find. And what about your own background, Penelope? How long have you been teaching for, firstly, and, and how did you get into that? Oh, uh, I won't even mention how many years I've been teaching. Um, I started when I was at school. I was teaching my friends. And then uh, when I was at college, I was teaching quite a lot of beginners. I supported myself. Then I got a job at a university teaching music. Then I got a job at a conservatoire. But I've, I've always done quite a wide range of levels and, and different types of teaching as well. Yeah. And the teaching that you had yourself as a child, would you call it quite traditional or was it quite progressive? What kind of lessons did you have? I think in those days, everything was pretty traditional. I was very lucky. I had a very good teacher at the beginning who uh, had been a Maté student, a student of Tobias Maté at the Royal College wow, of Music. Wow, yeah. So, I've read books about him. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I was in a small town in the south of England, and there I was with, a, with an excellent teacher. So I was really lucky. Um, but it was very traditional teaching, yes. And at what age did you start? About uh, six. Six, okay. And then right through your teenage years, and then pretty much straight after school, you studied music and went into teaching. So you, you've been in music and teaching education right through your career. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. I've always felt that teaching supported my playing and playing supported my teaching, so I've always done both. Mm. How have you seen, I mean, you've been teaching there for, for, for a, a little while, not too long. <laughs> How have you seen teaching change from your perspective over the last 10 years in particular? I think a lot of things have changed for the better. I think, I think teachers are more imaginative, they're kinder, they're more supportive, they're more flexible. I think in the past, people taught in one way and they taught all their students in the same way. Everything was taught by, by uh, you know, note reading was absolutely the most important thing. The technique was quite mechanical. And I think, I don't think you can teach in that way anymore. Students have got so many other distractions and attractive things to do that you have to make the lessons much more, much more engaging and much more enjoyable. Mm. I'm amazed when I hear about teachers who, because I'm, as you know, quite 
quite progressive and I love all the creativity and the yeah, yeah. let's go with, let's follow students and give them the, what they want as well as giving them the, the education we know they need. And, and some teachers are still just adamant. It's like, no, the, the traditional, the technique, look, it served us well for 200 years. It should still work now. But kids these days are different, right? Yeah. And I think we've also learned a lot since 100 years ago about how to play the piano, about how the body works and how, how the body functions and how to use the body at the instrument and how to create a beautiful sound. And I think teaching has changed a lot. And I think it still needs to change more. Yeah. How would you see it needing to change further? Well, I still find a lot of students come to me who've been taught technique, for instance, in a very, very mechanical way. And the, the technique was completely divorced from the musical content, really. And to me, you know, technique is about, it's about movement that creates sounds and it's preparation for, for pieces of music. It's got to have a musical purpose. So I think that's a, one thing that a, a lot of enlightened teachers obviously are doing. But there's still a, a lot of people teaching in, 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 the, in the old ways, really. Yeah. One of the challenges, I think, when it comes to technique, uh, particularly piano technique, is there's so many different ideas about it and schools of thought and books and approaches and websites and courses. <laughs> and, you know, one will say this, another will say that. I, I, and I've interviewed, I mean, this is my 200th and something episode. I've interviewed a lot of people about technique. And while there are similarities and things that we all do agree on, there's also a great range. How should teachers go about working out what is the right way? Is there a right way? I'll go straight on to my book here. Um, no, it's a good segue. Go for it. Yeah, because what, what I've been trying to do there is to really work out, and I've been working on this for 40 years now, on what is the most ergonomic, the most efficient in terms of uh, biomechanics, what's the most healthy way to play? And what I've discovered in the process is that whatever you're doing that, that works well with the body, with the, if the body's working in, the, in its most effective way, then that is also what produces the best sound. So there isn't one type of teaching which is healthy piano teaching and it produces a sort of floppy sound. No, it's not. I mean, I, I, what we're aiming for is the most varied, most interesting qualities of sound so that people can do whatever they want musically. Mm. And that comes about by really knowing what we're doing physically and using the whole body in a coordinated way. So, for instance, that the hands are really supported by the, the upper arm and, the, and the, the muscles of the back when we need it for something really strong. You know, if we're doing Tchaikovsky concerto or something, you can't just do it by just using your fingers. You have to really use your whole mat back to, to produce the fantastic sound. So it really, it really does depend on a few things, right? The, the work that we're doing, the music that we're engaged in, but also everybody's bodies are different too. So there are fundamental biomechanical movements, mm -hmm. but there's also differences between people's bodies. And I'm sure we'll, we can talk a little bit more about that in a moment. I did want to introduce people to your book, which I have here. I can barely hold it with one hand, Penelope. This is an <laughs> epic work. Oh, I, I now know you've said it took 40 years. I can tell why. So the book is called um, The Complete Pianist from Healthy Technique to Natural Artistry. And you released this this year, I think, in 2020. Yeah, is that right? Yeah. 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 This lockdown it's, started, yes. Yeah. It's over 500 pages. And really, I mean, we could do a podcast, I think, every day of the week <laughs> <laughs> and spend an hour on each chapter with no problem at all. We still have more to talk about. I mean, this is quite an epic work. What made you decide to write this? Was it just about the fact that you see so many teachers struggling with this or students struggling and you just want to want to help? Uh, what was the yeah, sort of exactly catalyst? I, and, you know, I remember all the things I struggled with when I was younger and I see people still struggling with the same problems. And I've been, you know, I've gained so much knowledge and experience over all these years of teaching and playing. And I work a lot with, with the medical profession as well, sort of trying to work out, you know, how, I work with some people who've, who've been injured and so I'm trying to help them to rehabilitate as well. And I've just got so much knowledge from all of this. I just wanted to share it with these people, with everybody else, so that people could avoid some of the problems that I had. And it's been great because quite a lot of friends of mine who are professional musicians, the first comment they made when they looked at the book was, 
I wish I'd had this book when I was younger. <laughs> it, would have sold, it would have saved me a lot of time and a lot of agony of going down wrong alleys and making terrible mistakes sometimes, yeah. And who do you see the book being for? More teachers or students themselves? I aimed it more for people who were grade six, ABS, RSM sort of level and above, and their teachers. But, and it goes up right up to professional level. There's a lot of things that professionals gain from, from reading it as well. I, but I do include a lot about beginners and intermediates as well. But it's aimed, but because it's such a big book, it would be very overwhelming for them. So I really aimed it more for their teachers and to give them some ideas about how to adapt some of the ideas for, for all different levels. Because I, I very much believe that if you've got the foundations right in piano playing, you know, if you've got the movements right, if, you're, if your body's well coordinated right from the beginning, then all those same techniques really go with you right the way through into, you know, being a music student or even being professional. The movements are very similar, whether you're at beginner's level or whether you're quite advanced. Uh, I've actually forgotten what the question was. What was it? <laughs> <laughs> I, it's fine. I, I was enjoying your response anyway. I was going to ask, how long did this take to write? I know it's 40 years of work, but how long did it take to actually, when you decided, okay, I'm going to turn this into oh, a book? Yeah. It was 15 years ago, I started writing sections of it. And um, those I put out as articles in, in a piano professional magazine in, in the UK. Mm. And then five years ago, I started writing it almost full time. Uh, and it, yeah, it took me that long. Going back to your question about who it's for, mm. what I'm currently doing at the moment is preparing some books for beginners, which are using a lot of the ideas from, from The Complete Pianist. But they're books that um, teachers are going to be able to use to put those ideas into practice with their students so they can give the students their, the books. Mm -hmm. And it'll, it can be used alongside any tutor book. And it'll just have lots of ideas on, on fun things to do with technique. Okay, for, like a companion to a teacher's method book approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I see, yeah. But it'll be fun, fun activities for which uh, serious technique, but in fun activities, yeah. Mm. I mean, my and the concern I have for teachers is because we're all time poor, <laughs> short of time, I should say, that it's it's so big they may not know where to start. What would you actually recommend? Okay, I know most of your listeners are teachers, and so right at the very beginning, I put a chapter for teachers. Um, so I'd really start with that that chapter. Read read because that's an introduction for how to use the book. Then, I mean, some people actually. Um, start from the beginning and have read it all the way through. It takes them quite a long time, but they've really appreciated it. Others just use it more as a reference book and pull it off their shelves when they've got a particular problem. So what you could do, say you've got, um, you know, say a student was struggling with an Alberti bass or something, you're doing a fast Alberti bass, you could go for that chapter. But what I would really recommend is that you sort of go for that section because there's a section on rotation. So there's a section on rotation leads into the Alberti base. So, you know, I would suggest that they, you know, there's an index and you can look up, you know, contents page and so on. So anything, you can just dip in and out when, when you find that you've got, you're not quite sure how to teach something or how to do something yourself. So it becomes um, a reference there. The on answer should be there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I think it can stay on people's shelves for years and they can just dip in and out when, when they feel they need it. So some of those common problems that we have with beginners, let's say, for example, um, bending back of knuckles, that last knuckle joint, buckled knuckles as I call it, it yeah, would there be yeah. something in there that you've got yes. to support that, for example? Yeah. yeah. There's exercises for every problem that you, you right. can ever Flat come fingers, so there's, there's, there's funny elbows. There's exercises for <laughs> Collapsing joints get strong. So there's exercises for strengthening the hand. There's um, exercises for, for cantabile, for moving quickly, for scales, for every aspect of technique. Mm -hmm. And a lot of exercises which are related to musical problems as well. So, yeah. And because playing is naturally a very visual and auditory exercise, have you got videos that go along with the explanations in the book? Yeah. So there's 300 videos and you wow. access them. By... <laughs> that would have taken a long time. I know how long it takes to record videos. That's, that's yeah. epic. Not quite sure. So I've, I've recorded all of them and you, they've got a QR code. So you can either access them on your phone or you can just um, 
open up the website and just watch them on the on the, the website and just oh great so you're looking at the the knuckle issue or whatever and i can see here i'm just holding up a, a copy of the book online demo video 10.22 available at edition peter slash compete pianist or you can just scan the qr code while you're in the book on that page yeah and you can watch what you're demonstrating yeah yeah this episode is presented in collaboration with our friends at the Francis Clark Centre. The Francis Clark Centre is a non-profit organisation committed to providing the highest quality resources for piano teaching, learning and performing. With an array of relevant online content, including free webinars, teaching videos, digital access to the Piano Magazine and Clavier Companion, and an online concert series, the Francis Clark Centre provides you with the tools you need to succeed as a piano educator in our rapidly changing world. Their online courses include comprehensive study on topics like teaching online, teaching beginners, and inclusive teaching. A new course on teaching pieces by black composers will be released in December 2020. The Francis Clark Centre also invites you to participate in NCKP 2021, The Piano Conference, a virtual event celebrating the transformative power of music. Experience over two weeks of interactive programming, sessions, and networking opportunities to connect with colleagues worldwide in July 2021. Register at nckp2021.com. That's nckp2021.com. For more information on Francis Clark Centre's offerings, visit claviercompanion.com. So take us through the, the main, what would you say the main sections are of the book? How have you kind of laid out this? Okay, I did it slightly differently to, to the sort of traditional way because I think most people start with finger touch. And I wanted to say, well, you know, unless you're sitting well, unless you've got a good sense of the whole body and a, a, a sort of broader approach, then it's very difficult for your fingers to work effectively. So I started with quite a sort of hot, uh, uh, talking about how we use the whole body at the instrument and do some warm ups and things like that. Then I went on to different types of touch, mm -hmm. finger touch, uh, and so on. There's a, a particular touch that I use called the parachute touch, where you're combining a sort of using arm weight with finger touch. And then, you know, all different aspects of playing, the chords and cantabile playing and rotation and quick leaps and, I mean, all aspects of technique. So I covered all the aspects of technique. And then... The whole of the next section is is about how we apply all these different aspects of technique to our music. So right. I'm I'm taking topics like sort of how do we play a melody really beautifully, how do we shape a phrase, um, how do we do a, a really lively rhythm, you know, how do we voice things to and how do we articulate and so on. But I'm I'm using the examples from from the technical things. So I'm really bringing the technique into into a sort of musical purpose here and then giving a lot of examples of different kinds of repertoire of different levels. And there's a big section on musicianship, but then there's, then I go on to things like, you know, how the mental preparation, how we practice, how we learn pieces, how we sight read. And yeah, it was great to see that, that bit about performance and preparation and anxiety, potential anxiety and yeah. things like that. I think that's so important. Playing in ensembles I saw at the end as well. I am impressed with the number of examples that you've got in here i mean there is so much music in here to demonstrate what you've shown and i think that mm. really brings a book like this alive because they can be quite dry if it's just a whole lot of text like an essay but yours is broken up you've got you know pulled out little you know, highlighted sections you've got examples heaps of musical scores um which i think is fantastic if i've got a particular problem with let's say one of the chopin ballads would this be the book where I could get help on actual pieces? Is there a way to search by piece? Uh, no, I didn't do – that was the one thing I didn't do because we, I'd got a, a very sort of comprehensive contents page and I've got a glossary, but mm. I didn't do an index of pieces because they're not specific lessons in a piece as maybe you might say, oh, I'm struggling with voicing this passage of the of – the, of the ballad, mm. or I'm struggling with this, you know, this octave line to make this really sound beautifully cantabile in a long line, even though I'm playing octave chords or something, or I'm I'm struggling with this scale, scale it passage or something. So it would be more that you'd look at, at a, 
particular type of passage that you're having trouble with and then you may find that piece as an right, example. Yeah. So yeah. isolating the technical exercise, going, okay, well, it's actually chords that us uh, chords that I need or octaves that I need help with or big leaps. So find that section yeah. of the book and you'll see the examples that you've given. Yeah. Mm. Have you got a favourite part of the book? I've, I always wonder whether authors like have a little like favourite child that's their favourite chapter. Oh, I don't think... I don't know. It's always the last one I sort of opened up and looked at again. As I was writing them, I actually got really, really engrossed in, in each of them and really enjoyed doing them all. The thing I think I'm most proud of is the exercises because those are completely new. Um, and what I did with each of those is I, I spent many, many years on each of the exercises. You know, the exercises for teaching arm weight, for instance. And, you know, I've been trying to do that for 40 years now. And I've started to develop more. And, and as, as the years went by, I got exercises that were much more concise and quick and where you could teach them in five minutes, mm. you know, and, and actually it would work. And, and it was quick and easy to do. And so what I was trying to do in the exercises was do a very simple movement, which actually was produced exactly the sound you wanted. And often I use sort of um, slightly quirky names or images from nature or, or just movements that we do in our everyday life. I was showing one... Um, to a student today where she she was actually having to do a rotation, a quick rotation out outwards onto the fifth finger. And I have a, I have an exercise where you're just chucking your cup out of the car window. And it's actually oh, yeah. the exactly <laughs> movement that you want in, 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 a, in a, a very exaggerated way. Mm. Um, so one can make it quite fun. Uh, it looks like a terribly serious book, but actually the exercises – can be made fun for, for, for students so they actually want to do them, you know. Mm. They're, they're not lengthy mechanical exercises. They're things where you're exploring what it feels like to play the piano and what it sounds like. Less journey, more something funner. <laughs> yeah, yes. And, uh, something that's really got a musical purpose, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think the use of analogies is, is hugely helpful for students when it comes to, like, the throwing the cup out the window or whatever, you know, those kind of... <laughs> Well, I've never thought of that one, but those kind of That's relationships actually, with it, it works. <laughs> yeah, with things that that students do. I, I know the piano safari method uses the idea of a lion paw for arm weight mm -hmm. notes. You know, kids can picture a big fat of a lion landing on mm -hmm. the key. You know, those kinds of things. I think I think that really does help. So giving things names um, is certainly useful. So Penelope, you've got, as you say, forty years plus incredible teaching experience you've written this in amazing book which honestly I, I think will stand the test of time and i think will be remembered and followed for decades to come just as we have you know i, I remember reading the lechatiski method uh the books on chopin's letters and all those kinds of things i think this one's going to stand there because it is so comprehensive there's nothing in there that you haven't covered. So congratulations. I think it's phenomenal. But given all this experience you've got, can you give us some mistakes that you commonly see teachers making that you would love to correct and have them think about? Well, as I said before, it's, it's too much mechanical work. And by mechanical work, you mean mindless scale repetitions mindless and things? finger exercises without actually thinking about the sound. I think teachers still do too much of that. But I think also they... At the, ver the very, very beginning, there's a, it is a massive challenge for a teacher to cover all that a, a, a pianist wants to cover in the first year because there's all that note learning, there's two hands, there's coordination, there's finger fingerings, there's, there's so much to do and finding the notes on the piano and everything else. It's very easy to put off actually getting the technique just as it should be. And as you said... You know, for instance, a lot of little children, they've got very weak hands. And so their, their, their main knuckles dip, you know, their little end joints dip. Or, or they might get very tense. And, and then what often happens is relating to that, because their hands are weak, what they do is they start to press very hard from the arm and they tense up the wrist in the process. Mm. So, you know, one problem can lead to another problem. And I think what we really need to do is to try to address those as we're going through all the other issues that we're going through in the first year of learning. And that's why, that's why I'm trying to produce these uh, beginner's books mm. to give some people things to work on. Because what I think we tend to get a bit stuck 
Kin is, is working around the middle C position. And the trouble with that is it brings the elbows in, it brings the shoulders up, and hands get twisted. It's a very unnatural position to play. It's a very unnatural position to be in, yeah. yeah. So what we want to be doing is, with our, with our students right from the beginning, is making sure that they've got real freedom of movement all around the piano mm. so they can move forward and back. So, so you know, I, I include a lot of um, black notes in the beginning, a lot of it by rote, so they just get, and then I, I call this exercise, which is just dusting the keys, where they're just swishing around. Oh, yeah. I call it elastic elbow, you know. So they're really getting confident with using the whole piano. And it's much more fun, too, because otherwise, mm. if you're just playing these boring five-finger exercises, it really doesn't give you much variety of sound. Mm. So I think um, exploring, exploring more movement around the keyboard um, is very important from the beginning because it, it gives that freedom of movement, which then allows them to extend into much more advanced repertoire as time goes by. Mm. And the other thing I think is really interesting to think about is that I know we actually all that actually we do eventually is depress the key. It's a tiny little movement. But behind that movement, there's a sort of whole coordination of arm movement that needs to to be behind it. And so, when I'm teaching, I use quite broad movements and I start with, you, you mentioned the lion's paw, I do something very similar. So you're making quite a big movement, which then teaches the whole arm how to support the fingers. And then you minimize it until eventually, yes, you're, you're doing tiny little movements, but they're very, um, very free movements because you started from a, a bigger, broader, freer movement mm. and then minimized it. My, yeah, my teacher used that approach. So make make the the movement big to start with and very controlled and very uh, conscious, and then as things go faster, they become smaller and smaller. But and while you yeah. may not be able to see them, they've been built in to how you're yeah. playing. And Corto, for instance, in his Yatacock, uh, I don't mm. know if you're familiar with that, but Corto, I mean, did you know? very very sort of wild movements, and you weren't trying to get any accuracy or any any control over it. You're just trying to get free movements. And then after a bit, you sort of control it and, and aim more for accuracy. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm on the same wavelength with, mm. with that. Yeah. And what's your approach to teaching detached playing right at the beginning versus legato, trying to play legato too soon? Do you find that teachers can sometimes make that mistake? Because I certainly did when I started. Yeah. I think legato for – especially little children with little hands, can be very, very difficult. I mean, that's how I was taught. But now, I mean, in this beginner's book I'm working on at the moment, yes, I'm starting with just using one finger. And if, if they need it, they can put their thumb, say they're working with the just, just playing with the third finger, mm. they can just put their thumb behind the end joint. So that, oh, so just, that it gives it some strength. It, it yes, strengthens that's... the finger so that they mm. can just actually bounce on that finger. And I think starting with the detached with detached notes – just encourages them also to use the arm and the, and the wrist in a in a more coordinated way. Mm. And then once they've got that, then they can start to use a bit more legato. I, I when I first start teaching legato, I'm doing a little bit of rolling from one finger to the next. So again, you're keeping freedom of movement and you're learning to transfer the weight. You drop the weight into the first note and then you transfer it over to the second note. So uh, I think. Um, yeah, I, I actually agree with you there that it, it's it's better to start with with detached notes and then and then work more towards more mm. regard. And as you say, we look back on our own teaching. My my uh, teacher, who I love to bits and taught me beautifully, she started with John Thompson, five finger, starting on middle C, reading very early on. Uh, and yep. I've learned that no, there are, there are so many. We've learned so much about piano teaching and the research around it. Mm. It's wonderful to see all these new methods that are available to us. There's such flexibility and interest and in, in difference in what's available mm -hmm. now to teachers. Uh, and yeah. most of them now are moving all around the keyboard and including rote repertoire and, and things. I think it's it's just wonderful. It's a great time to be a teacher. And also, I think there's quite a range of different types of tutor books and so on. So depending on who the student is and what age they are and what their personality is, you can choose a book that's mm. going to work well for them and go at a pace that's going to work for them. And so I think we've got a, a fantastic range of material now. 
Yes, yeah. we don't have to be locked into, and we should never be locked. It's the same with um, classroom teaching. I've, I was a classroom teacher as well, and it's so easy to just pull out the same book every year with the same group and just teach the same stuff. But when we're working one-on-one with students, you you have to choose mm. the approach to suit that student, which is why my teenage lessons are very different to my seven-year-old yeah. beginner lessons. I, I could probably course, we could probably yeah, talk yeah. Uh, piano teaching for a long time, um, <laughs> Penelope. But I'm going to wrap things up. It's been wonderful to chat with you, and there's I mean there's so much more to talk about. Obviously, we would love to encourage teachers to find your uh, find your book. So where should they go to find out more about the Complete Pianist? They can look on my website. That's got quite a lot of information on it. That's just just Google me, and it's PenelopeRoskell.co.uk. Most countries, at first, when the lockdown started, it was difficult to get it out to certain countries. But I know in Australia, I think Black Rock Music um, sell mm-hmm. it. In the States, Peter's Edition, who's the publisher, they they have a company in the States. So I think you can get it in most countries now. It's obviously you can get it from the big, big uh, online companies, but I strongly encourage you to support your local music shops, which are uh, struggling at the moment. Mm-hmm. So... Most of them can get hold of it for you, yeah. Yeah, that's great. And for more information about what you do, perhaps, in your own teaching, just penelbyroskill.co.uk, is that the best place to find out about what you're up to? Yeah, I put up information about workshops and classes that I'm doing. and I'm, I'm, I'm running a, a piano teacher's course uh, starting in January. Well, tell us about that. It's going to be a live one. It's a four-day one right. uh, for piano teachers. Uh, and then eventually that's going to be put out on, on a – as an online piano teacher's course that you can just sort of purchase and do in your own time as well. So, Is that part of the piano teacher's course, Lucinda Mackworth young or not related? No, no, oh, it's, okay. no, it's a, it's it's a separate own. one. This right, one okay. is about teaching piano technique. I'm focusing on that in this okay. one. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. But That's great. Four whole days of teaching. Piano of technique. Work. Yes. In uh, somewhere in England. Uh, it's going to be online. Oh, it will be online. Even the four day in January, that will be online. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Oh, that's great. Okay. Uh, and I believe you've got running a workshop tomorrow. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> tell, tell us yeah. about that for anyone that's listening and is in the UK. Um, that's on, on sort of building strong foundations right from the beginners. So if you're a teacher of beginners, it's showing, uh, showing ways to, to build strong foundations, technical foundations right from the first year, really. Right. And is that online as well or in person? Yeah, that's online too. Oh, wonderful. Okay. And all the information is at your website. Yeah. Great. We'll put a link in our show notes to that. We'll put a link to where you can yeah. find the book as well. Penelope, I'm delighted to have finally connected with you. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Oh, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks a lot, Tim. Thanks for inviting me. I hope you enjoyed meeting and chatting with Penelope today. And as I mentioned at the start, if you would like the chance to win a copy of her book delivered to you, if you're an Australian listener of the podcast, then you just need to make sure you're following us on Instagram or Facebook and then share one of the posts that we post about the podcast publicly on your profile. So, tell other people about it. Let us know what you like about it, those kinds of things. And make sure you tag us and use the hashtag TopCastGiveaway. And that will be decided uh, midnight. Auckland time, that's Auckland, New Zealand, on Monday. So, we're super happy and excited to be able to give one lucky person a copy of Penelope's book. Good luck. Next week on the podcast, we are going to be playing through some repertoire choices for teen students, uh, complete with the actual piano demonstrations. So, if you've got some of those tricky teen students you're a little bit unsure about, and they like those kind of new age, minimal, chord-based, feel music-y type repertoire choices that I'm going to be playing through a heap and making some recommendations next week on the podcast. Can't wait to chat with you again then. I'm Tim Topham and you've been listening to the Topcast from topmusic.co. I'll chat to you soon. For more information about this episode and to find out how to enhance your own teaching, visit topmusic.co. You'll find everything you need for your studio from lesson plans to cheat sheets, quick win teaching ideas and guides on how to build your teaching business. Plus, you'll be connected to a global community of the world's top music teachers. And when you're ready, join hundreds of other teachers around the world by becoming a Top Music Pro member and get access to all our bonus content and flagship courses. And don't forget to follow topmusic.co on social media and subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. That's all for today. We'll see you in the studio.